So I first would like to thank ASB for the chance to stand up here and to try to thank all of my graduate students and postdocs and undergrads that have helped me over the years. When I was told I had uh, 20 minutes to present and five minutes for questions, I thought about 20 years of research in 20 minutes, how do I do that and actually do justice to all the graduate students and postdocs and undergrads that I've worked with because it's really their work that has got me to this point. And I realized there's no way I can, so I accepted failure. I'm okay with that. Um, and I thought, instead of trying to really cover everything in 20 years, let me talk about sort of like the domineering uh, principles or policies that I've used in my own research uh, that I've tried to pass on. And the first really is that as a scientist, I'm looking at the human body as a machine. Um, and biomechanics is an incredibly valuable tool. And I think you could not do a good job at looking at how the human body functions without biomechanics. But on the other hand, I was fortunate enough to be trained by some very good comparative biologists um, who were trained at Harvard. And they um, looked at their research more from an uh, integrative perspective. You, it's not just a human, but it's an animal across this large number of species. And it's a lot of physiology. It's not just the biomechanics. There's energetics involved, and there's neural control involved. And everything we've done in my laboratory since setting it up has really been about trying to be as integrative as possible, because we want to understand how humans move, and we want to do it from not just biomechanics, but neural control and energetics. And I think everybody needs to remember that, that be a scientist first, and then a biomechanist, as the, the needs um, need, are there to answer your questions. And then the other thing I want to do as a corollary to that is that some people get a toolbox, and they have a given tool, and they realize they use that tool over and over again. And there's an old adage that says, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And I think in biomechanics uh, and studying human locomotion, don't be afraid to realize that you need more tools than what you have. And work with those collaborators, just as Jen just recently said. Um, you know, seek out other people that can teach you new things. Change what you're doing if you need to over the course of your career. And pick up new tools. And if you're going to get stuck with one hammer, at least make it a really cool hammer, I think. <laughs> um, and so this actually gets back, uh, the reason I really need to talk about my past bio biographical sketch is that it sort of lays the groundwork of where I ended up. Um, I grew up in Orlando. I went to undergrad at University of Central Florida, played football for them, and my undergrad degree was math education. Um, so that means I took a lot of math courses and they made me teach in the high school for a year, which was a very humbling experience and made me realize that maybe I need to go to grad school instead of trying to teach in the high school every year. Um, but I was turned on to STEM by sports and the idea of trying to figure out why my body was breaking. I broke um, two legs, a hand, a nose, and had major back surgery uh, throughout my football career. And that pretty much got me sort of interested in how do you keep your body together. Um, I went down to University of Miami and did a master's in exercise physiology. Um, and I played a lot of volleyball. And when I said I played a lot of volleyball, I also studied a lot of volleyball. My master's thesis was on fatigue of beach volleyball players jumping in sand. And my first ever published paper scientifically was on physical and physiological correlates of volleyball spiking speed. So um, I had a really good experience. Sports turned me on to the whole STEM idea. But then I was lucky to take a step of finding Roger Crom and Claire Farley. These were two new assistant professors that had come to Berkeley from Harvard and they were setting up their lab, and I was their first PhD student. And um, most of what I have accomplished in terms of mentoring has come from the experiences I've had from them. They were incredible mentors. They've taught me in so many ways, and I've tried to pass it on to my own students. Um, throughout my dissertation, I had four papers in my, uh, four chapters in my dissertation. Three of them dealt with running on compliant surfaces, very much a biomechanics study, all about kinematics and kinetics, trying to use Tom McMahon's model to carry it forward to deal with compliant running tracks. <laughs> and then I did one chapter on muscle activation and simulated reduced gravity. Um, all of this would be in the natural domain of biomechanics, and that was what my training was in. Um, but I was then lucky enough to set up my own lab at Michigan, 
and work with 19 incredible individuals for grad school. Um, all of these individuals are people that I've been primary or co-advisor of their dissertation. Um, they have helped me in so many ways and they're responsible for a lot of the research and um, getting me to where I am today. And I would love to give fair justice to each one and tell you about how incredible they are and the research they've done. Um, and I'm not gonna leave out my postdocs. Some of these people are in the room. They were also an incredible uh, help to the research. And if they weren't there to take over the lab when I went on sabbatical, thank you, Kara, um, and a whole lot of other mentoring of the graduate students and undergrads, then we wouldn't have gotten where we were. Um, so this award really belongs to them. And I would love to cut up the plaque into 32 pieces and send a little piece to every grad student and postdoc. Um, this is where we started. So what I'm showing you is uh, after doing my uh, PhD and postdoc, I set it up a lab and wanted to do robotics. I had no robotics training. Uh, I reached out to Blake Hannaford at University of Washington, got some good advice, experience, training. Uh, set up my lab and then got a bunch of grad students and we started building robotic exoskeletons back in 2001. Um, and I had a, a, an interesting idea which was not so much as building a commercial product, I wanted to use robotic exoskeletons to study how the human body was working. Because if you can all of a sudden provide assistance to a given joint, then that opens up the, um, uh, a lot of research studies to look at adapta adaptation, to look at muscle and joint function, and to look at the relationship between muscles and energetics. And so with our initial devices, we were building ankle and knee and hip exoskeletons, and we were controlling them with EMG. So we'd put muscle electrodes on the muscles, record the muscle activity, and actually use it to then activate the exoskeleton. So we're essentially making them stronger, and you can see that. Those are Keith Gordon's uh, tabs, by the way, in case you were wondering. Um, you can see that the ankle exoskeleton is responding in real time. And then we took young, healthy uh, college students and put it on them and said, let's see what happens when they try to walk. It's recording. And uh, turn the power on in five, four, three, two, one, on. So it actually turns out all of a sudden making one joint super strong makes it really hard to walk. Um, and it's an adaptation process that actually takes about 30 to 45 minutes. It's not fast. Um, there's a lot of motor learning that has to go on. Once you turn off the power, they actually go back pretty quickly because that's their normal state. But this allowed us to do a large number of studies over the years looking at motor adaptation during walking. Um, and it also allowed us um, to look at how different joints and muscles contribute to the energetic cost of locomotion. So here's uh, Aaron Young's uh, hip exoskeleton. He was a postdoc of mine now at Georgia Tech. We've helped out different joints, and then looked at the energetic effects. So all joints and muscles are not created equal. We've heard many times in this meeting how the Achilles tendon does a great job of storing and returning elastic energy. So if I can build an exoskeleton to help somebody at the ankle, maybe that's very different than building an exoskeleton to help somebody at the hip. And we need to understand that before we try to build a commercial product. So when you do enough studies and you actually look at the changes in energetic cost when you're helping out different joints, you can actually back calculate the relative apparent efficiency of these different joints. And so if I help you out at the hip or the knee, you actually get a pretty big savings in metabolic cost. And you can calculate that the efficiency of those muscles that were doing work must be somewhere around 25%, 24%. But if I help out the ankle of a healthy young individual, it looks like you don't get as much energetic benefit because the ankle muscles are already so efficient. They're storing and returning elastic energy in the Achilles tendon, and you don't have to use as much muscle work to get the work done at the ankle. And it turns out when you look at these exoskeleton data from energetics and compare it to in vivo ultrasound data of what the muscles and tendons are doing, you get an almost identical match in terms of the relative contributions of muscle and tendon. So that's sort of verification that these numbers are actually working out the way we think. Um, but it again gets back to relating how the human body is functioning as a machine. And we can show that you can break down the work done on the ankle and the knee and the hip during walking. And you get that pie chart showing you that the hip and the ankle are really, really important. 
But then when you actually look at the energetic cost of where we're burning energy, it actually turns out the hip becomes even more important because its efficiency is lower. And so if you are going to be able to build an exoskeleton to reduce energy costs, the hip's a really good place to target. And this is the type of flavor of research that we've been doing to look at really that basic biological science. I am one of those 27 regular members that is a member of the biological science crowd. But that's what we're trying to figure out is how the human body is working. One of my students, Stephanie Huang, who's not here, um, really wanted to take that exoskeleton technology and move it forward to amputees. She thought that given how well it was working on exoskeletons, maybe we can control prosthesis the same way. So if you're familiar with amputee research um, and dealing with subjects who've had lower limb amputation, you know that the morphology can be very different by subjects, depending on how their injury occurred, how the surgery was done. If you look at the subject on the left and the subject in the middle there, you'll see that there's very different um, levels of muscle tissue that are left in these amputees. But it turns out if you put electrodes on the skin over the residual muscles, they still have volitional control over those muscles even many years, 10 or 15, 20 years afterwards. In most cases, they can control those muscles. So if they can volitionally control it, can we actually embed electrodes inside the socket, get the signals out, and use it to control a prosthesis? Well, it turns out most of the companies that are building powered prostheses don't want you to hack their systems. They don't want you to come up with a better controller for their device than what they have. So we ended up having to build our own device, um, which is a uh, powered lower limb prosthesis that was adjustable for different individuals. We used their own socket and attached it to a pneumatically powered uh, prosthesis. Because it's pneumatically powered, it's not going to be a commercial viable product. It's not going to let you walk to the mall or to school or work. But in the laboratory, it works pretty well. And we were able to test a number of su uh, amputee subjects to see could they actually learn to control the prosthesis with their brain because they're sending the electrical signals from their brain to their spinal cord to the muscle and do they get a signal that actually allows them to walk. This is an amputee subject cool. who's going through some training in our old lab at University of Michigan. Oh my gosh, don't fall. She has Wait, direct volitional side. control. She can go on her toes, yeah, she ahead. can tap her foot, she can reach up to get something off of a shelf, or she go can ahead, walk. Go ahead. All right. Good. This was okay. a, a really nice thing because instead of using a state machine to try to figure out what their intent was, they could learn and adapt. So you really have a co -a, a, an adaptive controller, which is the human. It's figuring out how to modify muscle activity so that they can move and walk. When you do it in this manner, they can improve with practice. It turns out that you're much better off pushing them out of their comfort zone and giving them visual feedback because if you just give this to them and let them walk, they walk just like their passive prosthesis. They're so used to that motor pattern, they think this is the way I walk, this is the way I should walk. And when you give them visual feedback, you can actually teach them to push off with much more uh, mechanical power at the trailing limb. So uh, right now we're going through a series of designing a portable device using a series elastic actuator to test this for overground locomotion out in the real world. <laughs> yes, that's me. So this is one of my sabbaticals where I ventured out and got out of my comfort zone. Um, and when Kara took over the lab for me. Um, but really, I was really curious at a finding. When we try to talk to these amputee subjects and when we talk to the people walking with exoskeletons, they look like they get it down and they know what they're doing. But when you talk to them, they lost it again and they'd become very uncoordinated. Um, and they'd be like, stop talking to me. And I'm like, why? And they're like, I need to concentrate. What are you concentrating on? And they're like, I don't know. I just got to think about walking. In that early stage of walking with an exoskeleton or a powered prosthesis, they really have to devote mental attention to it. And I was really curious to find a way to actually quantify what's going on in their brain so that we could track how they're adapting, so that we can figure out if there are different ways that we can speed them along in that process. So I went to work with, uh, at UC San Diego with Scott McKaig and um, Klaus Grauman, and they taught me how to do EEG. This is me with 256 electrodes on my head. Um, throughout the time, I'm not going to go through all the details, published a ton of papers, 
the initial um, results were highly s doubted by the community. They felt like EEG during locomotion is not possible. There's too much motion artifact. What's going on is that you're just shaking the electrodes and getting activity. That's all you really have. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to validate it and how to make our signals better. And in the end, we did engineering. We had to design our own electrodes. Um, what you see is a dual electrode where we have our normal electrode going down. We take a second electrode, we invert it, and we put a fake artificial skin over the top and a cap. And what this essentially does is deal with Bose noise-canceling headphones. If you've ever used them, they um, monitor the surrounding sound, ambient noise, and they subtract it out of your um, music, and you get a much higher fidelity um, listening. This is what we do with these dual electrodes, and then we had to figure out a way to convince all these skeptics that what we're getting is real. So, number one, I became incredibly more familiar with head motion mechanics during locomotion than I ever thought I wanted to be. When I look back at all of our spring mass models where we take all the torso and the mass and put it to one point, that made me just totally ignore that head motion stuff. And then you look at many of the musculoskeletal models and they take that whole torso and put it into one mass and we ignore all that head motion stuff. But it turns out it becomes really important when you're trying to get sensors to figure out what's going on in your head. And so we did a lot of studies looking at head motion during walking and running and how there's six degree freedom of motion. And then we ended up building our own um, electrical head phantoms. So what this is, is an electrical brain surrounded by either dental plaster or um, ballistics gel mixed with salt so that we can mimic different tissues mechanically and electrically. And now we know what the ground truth is. If we try to measure me while I'm walking, I have no idea what's really going on in my brain. But if I'm measuring electrical activity out of these phantoms, I know what's going on in their brain. So I can say, how good can we reproduce it? And then we had to figure out a way to reproduce those head motions that I told you about. And what we ended up doing is buying this wonderful six degree freedom uh, motion platform and replaying real kinematics from a person while they're walking. So this is uh, one of my grad students' head motion while he's walking at two meters per second. Um, then we have our dual electrodes on, we have the wires going off, and we know the ground truth that we're playing. On the left, our um, electrical uh, amplitude from eight different um, EEG channels from the top to the bottom, one through eight, time series. That's what the rest of the world gets in regular EEG electrodes. On the right is our subtracted data, so using our dual electrodes after we remove all that motion artifact. And it looks cleaner to the eye. I can tell you that when you go through the processing that we go through, the digital signal processing with independent component analysis, we can actually recover signals that are coming from different parts of the brain that we just broadcast, and we can show that the co cross-correlation shows greater than 0.9 agreement for all of our sources. So we finally are starting to convince people that what we're doing is not just motion artifact. We've gone back and documented it. I didn't mean to start out working on six degree of freedom motion of somebody's head or building electrical head phantoms or doing new electro designs, but I was open to it because I couldn't go out and buy the tools that I really wanted. And that was one of the things I learned from Roger, who loves to do things on the cheap, is that rather than going out and trying to buy something, see if you can build it yourself. And so we went through a, a long history of trying to figure out ways to make this happen. Okay, so let's get to a real biomechanical application of all this now. Um, this is Shaquille O'Neal, um, who I like to pick on because he used to be with Orlando Magic where I grew up and then he left us. Um, as people get older, they tend to fall more. That is not news to this crowd, right? Um, in many ways, this is a biomechanical problem. And it's not really the fall that's the problem, it's the landing that's the problem. But the fall comes before that landing. And from a biomechanist standpoint, we're like, oh, well, maybe what's going on is their muscles aren't responding, they're not generating the power, they're not responding, having a larger, a great enough margin of stability. All that is true. But part of this is happening on in their brain that determines why they're not responding. And if you can't look into their brain, then you don't have a really good idea what's causing this fall for an elderly, for an individual with a uh, prosthetic, for an individual with stroke or spinal cord injury. We need a way to sort of figure out when do they sense it? When do they do the calculations to start to respond for the fall? And when do they actually respond with the biomechanics? And by using the EEG, we can actually break it down. 
And one of the goals that we had with using the EEG and looking at falls was actually can we come up with better interventions for falling? Because we know that we want them to not fall as much. There were lots of studies here that looked at ways to push and pull people or do training um, because we want less falls. But if we don't really understand the neural mechanisms, it makes it really hard to design the best interventions. So, Steven Peterson, one of my uh, most recent grad students, he's defending next Friday, has published uh, three papers in a row just this last month. Um, and one of the cool papers, we wanted to know if you're going to do interventions for people, do people respond to being pushed and pulled in the same way that you give them virtual reality visual perturbations? So some people like to use virtual reality and change what they see. Some people like to push or pull individuals. In both cases, you can seem to get a reaction and they learn to not fall as much. So we have this really unique paradigm that Antoinette Domingo came up with that we mount a, a balance beam on a treadmill so that we can have really discrete events of them losing their balance in a very safe manner. They're not walking on that wide balance beam. We know that they just lost their balance. On the left, the subjects are being pulled to the left or the right. On the right, the subjects are in virtual reality, but this is um, really virtual reality of their world. It's got a camera on the outside of the um, Oculus Rift that monitors the real world, and then it plays it back in their screen. So they see everything in the real world, but we can then intercede and modify it. And the intervention that Stephen was using is he puts a 20 degree rotation on their vision. So if you're a fan of the old Batman series, you know that when you went to the bad guy's lair, they turned, tilted the camera, so it was a cue that you're in the bad guy's lair. But we just did that for half a second, and then we went back. And it was only a brief 10% of the time that they actually have this vision. So these are very different perturbations, and we wanted to look at how the brain was responding. So we use um, our EEG to then um, go through independent component analysis. What you see on the top is a normalized brain map with all of the data from all 20 subjects. And each individual sphere is from a origin of electrical activity related to um, falling and the perturbation uh, for an individual subject. And we localize it with an inverse head model. We then um, cluster them based on their spectral properties and location. And the bottom three are the mean areas. So we cluster them into certain areas of the brain that we can track that seem to be related to these perturbations. When you do that, you actually get a very different um, indication of what's going on in the brain with these two types of interventions. On the right, what I'm showing you is all of the brain data um, for a visual perturbation. So the x-axis is time. There's two vertical dashed lines. That's the first perturbation. And that is when the perturbation goes away. And then there's eight brain areas, left sensory motor, right sensory motor, anterior cingulate, which is an error monitoring place, part of your brain, posterior parietal, anterior parietal, right occipital, and left occipital. And so if you look at, on the y-axis, we have the frequency content of the electrical activity. And then red basically means that the neurons are becoming highly synchronized with high power. And blue means they're becoming highly desynchronized, so they're doing independent things. And that's a very typical response for perturbation. Um, but what you see is it's occipital, which are visual areas, which we really, if we didn't see that, we would have been in trouble. But then we see a very large response from posterior parietal. This is telling because the posterior parietal area of your brain is highly involved in coordination of your limb. And there's a lot of data from animal models that suggest it's important for motor learning, dealing with your position of your body relative to whatever task you're doing. Okay. No, very little response, sensory motor cortex, supplementary motor area. When you compare the visual response on the right to the physical perturbation being put, pulled while you're walking, you'll see that you're primarily getting sensory motor cortex, supplementary motor area, anterior cingulate, and a little bit of pr anterior parietal. Very little posterior parietal, very little occipital, which is kind of what we expected for occipital. But you're getting different effects on the brain. Same thing can be said of the EMG. If I push or pull you, your lower limb muscles quickly fire in response. If I visually perturb you, your muscles don't respond. It is very much a case where you don't um, check it as an error, but you say, oh, I need to focus on my proprioception, and you prime that posterior parietal cortex. 
So we thought that what we could do is train people better to walk on that balance beam. So we took another group of subjects, trained them for 30 minutes walking on the balance beam, did a pre-test and a post-test to see how much they fell, and we had one group that was using the virtual reality and one group virtual reality with, with, with perturbations. And when you do that comparison, they fall the same amount, but the group with the visual perturbations gets much, much better, four times as much reduction in falls. So I think that this is a way for insight into a biomechanical problem by using these brain imaging tools. So to sum up, two biggest things I want you to take home is remember that we're looking at integrated individuals. They have biomechanics, they have energetics, they have neural control. Don't really limit yourself to one tool. Find cool tools and find other ways to add in these nice tools that are going to allow you to do things that you really want to do. Uh, I want to thank my funding sources, ARL, ONR, NSF, NIH. This was our last Halloween party at the lab. Um, and then I will mention uh, we are hiring at University of Florida, so eight <laughs> positions. Feel free to talk to me later. Thank you. And I'd like to officially congratulate Dr. Ferris as being the 2018 winner of the Founders Award for the American Society of Biomechanics. <laughs>